those that have substance abuse problems overcome them. And uh, we have a graduate today, a 32 week program, year long program. Becca's been with us for a long time now. Becca, we wanna welcome you on up here. You're graduating today, give it up for Becca. Start that recording if you haven't done it already. Good. <laughs> Becca, your boy's coming with you. Tell me, come on. Come on now. He's part of the reason why you did this, right? Yes. So it is with great pride, and uh, I tell you what, we're just so excited that we get to hand you this certificate. We're so proud of you. You've worked hard and diligent. You've done all your Bible verses, all your memory verses, all your lessons, all your studies, all the work details, all the different things that have to do, and, and not to mention you know, all the things that, you know. Anyways, you did a good job. I'm gonna let you speak. Uh, I just wanna say thank you to the Promised Land staff and leadership, and to my friends and family that supported me and encouraged me and kept me on the right path, so thank you. Blow it up. Blow it up. You're gonna leave me hanging. That's not good to leave Pastor hanging like that. Okay. Well, why Becca's up here with Colton? Let's get all the kids up here in the praise team. Let's get this service started. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we welcome your power and your presence here. We ask, Lord, that you would anoint this time. Lord God, that you would just move. Speak what you want spoken. Be with the children as they go to kids' class. Allow, allow them to learn what they need to learn. And just allow this day to be all about you. In Jesus' name, amen. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me. The for me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me. I will follow. Though not go with me, still I will follow. Though not go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning, no turning back. back, no turning back, no turning back. No turning All right, let's hear it for our kids. Kids, you can be released at this time. Parents, please go sign your children in. And while they're all parents are all out there signing their children in, let's all stand. We're going to fellowship. I do have a quick story I want to tell you while we're just waiting on that. Did everybody get to see Poppy today? I don't know. Does Poppy still back here? She took Poppy. My, my daughter got this life-size Barbie doll for, for Christmas. It's about this big. And uh, the funniest thing ever, you'll love this story. We're in the car going to Tallahassee. And she looks at me and she says, Daddy, 
Poppy keeps winning the quiet game. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, she is winning the quiet game. She doesn't speak. It's just a doll. She said, I think she learned it in the box. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Y'all fellowship, get to know one another real quick. If you'll make your way back to your seat, we're going to just remain standing as we worship together. Just kind of find your way back to your seats and remain standing as we worship together. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures you won't walk out your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa. you are the peace in my troubled sea in the silence you won't let go in the questions your truth will hold your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa. you are the peace in my troubled sea come on everybody together now my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the darkness tomorrow brings with each morning on, i'll rise it. and sing my god's love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa. you are the peace in my troubled sea to learn this song too but I want everybody to see the lyrics of it and especially the the third verse I won't fear what tomorrow brings the third William the third I won't fear what tomorrow brings with each morning I'll rise and sing my God's love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. You know, whenever we follow Jesus, whenever we decided to follow Jesus, 
that the trouble sea is still there that we go through but we have Jesus we have Jesus that help Amen. us to go through the trouble sea and the most important thing is that he will give the peace the peace Amen. in the midst in the midst of the trouble in the midst of the problem I know every morning the first thing whenever we wake up we want to take all the list that we want to do but have we ever have we ever checked with God what he wants us to do that's right it's not what we want what we want us to do and each morning I encourage everybody in this church the first thing you do you wake up the first thing that you seek him and you sing and you worship him and I promise you your day will be a lot that's right. better that's right won't be what tomorrow brings with each morning i'll rise and sing my god's love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea yes you are lord you are the peace in my troubled Just for a minute, let me get the ushers up here. Wow. My lighthouse. That's good stuff. I don't know about y'all, but I had a great Christmas. Amen? Amen. Jesus Christ came to the earth almost 2,000 years ago. God in flesh, incarnated, and he was born to be with me. To take away the sins of the world to set me free you know that excites me because I'm not left in this world alone I'm not left to to struggle through life and the storms alone I have a lighthouse amen that's right yeah father I just ask right now that you bless this offering Lord that you use it for your purposes Lord that you would just honor that you would be honored by your people. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We also have a uh, Christian. Get with the program. Yes, we have a guest uh, musician today. Dante's auntie was uh, requested to sing. It looks like Dante didn't tell his auntie this. Uh, but he asked us about it. Yeah, okay. Because she looked at me like, what? What you talking about? So, uh, Dante's auntie. 
auntie, Dante's auntie, Dante Dante, say that 10 times real fast. That, that'll work you up, right, amen? Tongue twister, tongue twister. Come on, join us. Uh, uh, I, f- I forget the, the first name, first and last name. Linda. Praise the Lord, everybody. I want to just encourage my nephew as he goes through this process, along with the others that are here that are struggling through their situation. Not necessarily a Christmas song, but I just want you to know that there's power in the name of Jesus. That no matter what you're going through, you can just call on him anytime any day, any hour, and he's always there for you. So just whenever you feel like you're all by yourself, just know that there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. There is healing in the name of Jesus. I want you to know today that say there is healing in the name of Jesus. There is healing in the name of Jesus to break every chain, to break every chain. To break every chain, there's an army rising up. There is an army rising up. There is an army. To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power, y'all, in the name of Jesus. And I declare today that it will, it will break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. And right now I just want to let you know, I hear the chains falling. Yes, I do. I hear the chains falling. I hear it right now in my spirit, y'all. Yes, I do. I hear, I hear the chains. I hear the chains falling. Yes, I do. It'll break every chain. Jesus will break every chain. He will break every chain. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. Dante, he will break every chain. He'll break every chain. He'll break every chain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, just worship in here today. Hallelujah. He'll break every chain. He'll break every chain. He'll break every chain. 
Hallelujah. Let's stand and worship together. Oh, 
Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah. Check one, two. Yes, I'm on. How about that? I thought we had another song, so I was confused. Amen. So, uh, y'all know what's coming up, right? You know what happens after Christmas? New Year's, right? How many of y'all excited about a new year? Look, I know some people really get into like New Year's Eve celebrations and all that kind of stuff, you know. I was sharing with somebody earlier today that, uh, you know, New Year's Day doesn't really excite me that much. It just never has, you know. It's just one of those things. It just means I get to mess up on the next three months' checks, you know. I had to scratch out and change the year on the checks, you know, that you're right, you know. Uh, Yeah, some people are with me on that. They understand that. But you know what I didn't think of is how important it is to some folks that are here. Because the person I was sharing that with said to me, said, well, that's probably true. I understand why it's not necessarily, you know, that big of a deal. Because I told him, you know, today's the day of salvation, right? You can start new today. You don't have to wait till January 1st, right? Any day can be the beginning of something new. Amen. And so he said, yeah, I understand that, but, but this would be my first New Year's sober in probably about 25 years. And so I tell you what, it's exciting, isn't it? Because there's people in here that have changed the direction of their life because they're looking to Jesus Christ. And they're looking with anticipation for the new year and what it has in store. And that's exciting. Now... I, today's title is called Don't Quit or Never Ever Give Up, which uh, the guy writing this on the CDs and the DVDs, by the way, they're free for your taking when you leave. You can have them, take them to your friends and family members. Said don't ever, ever give up is too much to write on that CD, so he's writing Don't Quit. So <laughs> today's title is Don't Quit. And as the new year approaches, one of the things I like to do, and I don't know if anybody else likes to do, is I kind of like to look at what's happened this past year. Kind of take an inventory, you know, of, of the things that have happened, the direction that I've been going, and, and things like that. So I like to do that. And so today's message is don't quit. And, and I have an illustration to tell you. It's an extreme illustration, but I'm going to give it to you. In fact, it's called Hell Week. For those who don't know anything about Navy SEALs, they go through what they call Hell Week. And uh, the soldiers are pushed to their limits physically, mentally, and emotionally during this time. In fact, they're forced to operate with little or no sleep. They're put through trials and exercises that exhaust them and stretch them to the very limits of a human being. Obstacle courses, underwater swims, forced hikes are only a sample of what they endure. There's only two ways out of Hell Week. One is to graduate, to survive. The other is to ring the bell. If you ring the bell, you can get out of Hell Week. 70% of the individuals that go through Navy SEAL training ring the bell before they complete those five days. Now think about that. It's five days. You would think anybody could hold on to anything for five days. No. No, you can't. Sometimes you just can't. And so that's the, that's the title's message. Don't quit. It's five days. Five days of grueling training, thus graduating to SEALs. Or the second way, of course, is 70% of candidates ring out prior to completion. The pain is too much. They lack the endurance. Their minds begin to play tricks on them. The obstacles are too high. The lack of sleep clouds their thinking. And they break to the pressure and the stress. And they walk forward and they ring the bell. And they get out of hell week. They quit. They give up. They fail to complete the course. They bail out. They don't complete the mission. They refuse to stay on track. It's tough. The circumstances are grueling and they crumple under the pressure. I think a lot of them, of those 70% that ring the bell, probably anticipated that it wasn't going to be nearly as hard 
as they thought it was going to be. If that's God, tell them I said hi. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that a lot of them thought that it wasn't nearly as difficult as they thought it was going to be. Any, anybody here ever been married? Yes. Okay, there's a slew of hands that went up there. I won't ask if you're still married. That's a different, that's a different questionnaire. Uh, <laughs> Janet, who just got married on Sunday, said, I am, okay? So, <laughs> way to go, Janet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, marriage can surprise you, can it? Yeah. I mean, you, 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 you're, you're in love with this person. You, you, everything's perfect. You say, I do. Y'all go home. You start, you know, melding and shaping to, you know, whatever comes about. And sometimes it kind of surprises you. Like, you didn't know that's what marriage was all about. Like, what? You, you do this. You do that. You know, I, I, I wasn't aware of these things, you know. And, and so it, it can take you by surprise. And so I, I, think, I think a lot of our, our Navy SEALs, as they, as they get ready to go into this, this hell week, this training, they're, they're taken aback. They're taken a surprise because they don't anticipate how difficult it's going to be. So all of you youngins out there are thinking about getting married, I'm going to tell you something right now. Marriage is a commitment. If you get married because of the pitter-patter of your heart, that's the wrong thing to get married for. Because I trust me, within a few short months, weeks, years, whatever it takes, the pitter-patter stops and you have a decision to make whether or not you're going to be committed to the person you're married to or not. Regardless of what happens. Because yeah. somebody could adjust the temperature. I see people's teeth starting to chatter just a little bit. Turn it up just a little bit. Thank you. Yes. And so we need to know what's in store for us. And I, I go through this whole illustration because I think this Christian walk falls in the same line. I think a lot of times preachers get up and, and they give this impression that if you'll just give your life to Christ, everything will be fine. In the end, it will be okay when you get to heaven. In the end, it will be okay. But this Christian life, this Christian walk, this, this living a life accordance to the word of God, to surrender your will to his will, to adopt his lifestyle and his characteristics and who he is instead of who you are in your wants and your desires and in and, and the deep innermost parts of yourself is a grueling and taunting task that many people will begin to make those motions towards but then quit. They'll ring the bell. They'll step out. They'll say, you know what? This isn't for me. If I knew it was going to be this hard, I would have just continued what I was doing because the devil was leaving me alone when I was serving him. In fact, if the devil's leaving you alone right now, you might want to check your life and make sure you're living for God. Because when you're living for God, and trust me, somebody who's been trying to live for God the best he knows how for over 14 years, maybe like 20 some odd years, you know, I don't want to tell my age, but it's beside the point. <laughs> it's grueling. Sometimes it, hush now. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it feels like you take three steps forward and ten steps back. You know what I'm saying? It just, it, 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 it's, it's grueling. It's taunting. And if you're not prepared and ready for it, you'll quit. You'll walk away. And friends, I, I want to tell you something. That's not what God has in store for us. You know, in fact, let's turn to Scripture. Let's read what the Scripture has said. We'll go to Matthew chapter 24, <laughs> verse 4. says, Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah and will deceive many. For those who don't know the context of the scripture we're reading, this is Jesus answering what will be the signs of the end of time. Okay? Jesus is answering his disciples about what the signs are at the end of time. Verse 4 says, Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginning of the birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Whew. That's some hard language, isn't it? 
That doesn't sound like, hey, y'all come follow me. Everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be honky-dory. You're never going to have to worry about paying your bills, what you're going to eat for dinner, or, you know, what your kids are doing, you know, because I'm going to be watching over them day and night. Everything's going to just be, ah, you know. Like, you know, see butterflies floating around and music in the background, you know. Like the cartoons, right? Now, listen, if you had seven kids, you know all about cartoons, okay? Yeah. That's not what he says. This is Jesus talking. If you can trust anything, it's what Jesus says. Jesus himself says, then you will be handed over to be persecuted. Look, just when all things were falling apart and you didn't think it could get any worse, then you, you who are Christians, you who are followers of me, you who love me, you who follow Jesus, you who serve him, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. One of the things I know about being in public, in the public light, is that you can go just about anywhere and talk about God, and people are A-OK. They won't hardly bother you at all. You start talking about what Jesus has done for you, you offended me. Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about my Jesus, you know, until I can't say it publicly no more, and then I'm going to do it anyways, you know. If I die, I die. I'm living forever, amen? Amen. Okay. At that time, many will turn away from the faith. And Jesus is telling many people are going to turn away from the faith because they're not prepared and ready for hell week. And friends, I'm telling you, hell week's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's written in the word of God. It's coming. We had better be prepared and ready. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many because of the increase of wickedness. And the love of most will grow cold. Have you noticed an increase of wickedness lately? You know, I, I remember way back many moons ago. In Tallahassee, there was a billboard across from this club that said, sin is in. I really wanted to get the billboard next to it that said, hell is hot. But, you know, that was just me. You know, I, I didn't have the resources. Otherwise, I probably would have. But that was years ago. Now you look around and people aren't even trying to hide anything anymore. They're just fragrantly just living you know, sinful lifestyles. And, and, and now it, it's almost like when you try to tell somebody in love that you're headed the wrong direction, that the things you're doing are destroying you, that that's not what God has in store for you, they get angry with you. And the first thing they want to say is, don't judge me. Doesn't the Bible say not to judge? Actually, it says we're to judge those inside the church and let the world, let him judge those outside the church. You know? You know, what, what does it say? It says judge not, least ye be judged. In the same measure you measure others, others will measure you. It's okay. It's not judgmental to love somebody enough to not to want to see them go to hell. That's love. It's not judgmental to care about somebody that, that, that you see is doing something that's destroying their life, destroying their family, destroying their home, and to speak out and say, you know what, let me pray with you about this. Let's deal with this. That's not judgmental. That's love. You know, but th that's what they want to say. The love of wickedness will increase. The love of most will grow cold. And here's the verse I want to focus on today. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Who's going to be saved? Those that stand firm to the end. Now listen, we're not going to get into theology about once saved, always saved. If you said the sinner's prayer when you're like five years old, if you're still saved or not, that's between you and God. What I will tell you is I believe that once you've given your heart and life to God, you can't lose salvation because you're sealed into that day of death. But I also believe there's many people that had an emotional experience but they never fully gave their life to God. And they're holding on to some words that they repeated and they didn't mean because a saved life is a changed life. And friends, I want to tell you something. When you give your life to God, you will not be able to live the same way you've continued to live for the rest of your life. There will be a change. Now, there may be, there may be moments that you fall backwards, but he ain't going to leave you there. 
He's going to draw you back. In fact, that's why a lot of y'all in church today. Because y'all heard some good preaching when you was a little kid and you walked away. And now you're like, I got to get back right with God. Amen. Okay, that's why you're in church today. That's why I'm in church today. Amen. But those that stand firm to the end will be saved. Statistics day. Now, this is going to blow your mind. 1,500 pastors. 1,500 people that have committed their life to the service of God. 1,500 people that have been standing behind pulpits like this. 1,500 individuals a month, a month, are turning their back and leaving the ministry and walking away from God. 1,500 people. They're worn out. They've been abused. They're disheartened. They're debilitated by the hard work of ministry to the point that they give up, they quit, they ring the bell, and they walk away. 70% of those that are in ages between 23 and 30 years old, and I know many of y'all are over that, that's okay, will drop out of church. 70% of 23 to 30-year-olds are going to drop out of church. Scary statistics, isn't it? It says that our youth, 98% of teenagers that were going to church as teenagers and committed to their youth groups and committed to church, 98% of them, 98, will stop going to church. I tell you what, if y'all ain't never been on this side of the podium, it's hard work. If you ain't never had to be a teacher or a minister or a Sunday school teacher or somebody that was trying to encourage them, it's hard work. Okay? Then there are, those that are, there are those that keep coming to church. They don't stop coming to church. They keep coming. But they've checked out spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. They've rung the bell. Their bodies are still here. Because their grandma's here, their uncle's here, somebody's here. They got to be here. Their mama and daddy's here. Mama and daddy's a pastor and a worship leader. They got to be here. Whatever the case is, there's some that are still coming to church, but they've checked out. They're not involved. Friends, we have small groups. We have all kinds of small groups. We got a yard sale small group. You want to go yard sale and get a bunch of people together and go yard sale and pray about it. Pray for some good deals. Amen. Oh, Jesus, bless this yard sale. I'm going to get me a good deal, right? Amen. Pray about everything, right? We've got movie night. How many churches you know got movie night? At last Friday of every month, we have a movie. We haven't done it th uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas because it's fall on the last Friday. This January starts back up movie night. We're playing War Room. Has anybody heard about the movie War Room? Yeah. It's a good movie. You don't want to miss it. We've got movie night. We've got, we've got ladies' intercessory prayer. We've got ladies' fellowship, men's prayer breakfast, small group at the pastor's house. You, know? you can come hang out with us and eat some fried chicken or something. You know? Uh, you know, we're going to have a good time. We've got all kinds of small groups coming up. That's so that you can plug in. So you don't check out because you know what? Just coming to church on Sunday morning ain't enough to make it through the rest of the week. And I understand sometimes you can't make Wednesday night because of work, this, that, and other. But there's some kind of group, some kind of fellowship. If there ain't one that you can attend, start one. Yeah. Maybe some other folks can join yours. Amen? You got to plug in. Otherwise, you're going to quit engaging, quit connecting. You're going to drop out, ring the bell. You'll quit worshiping, quit pressing it. I don't know if y'all realize this or not about this church, but we love to worship. We love to be loud. Amen? I figured I'd get a few more amens on that. We love to be loud, and I've told y'all this before, we're going to stay loud, okay? Maybe not as loud as we are right now, but we stay loud, because nobody wants to hear me singing. I was really offended Christmas night. We were in here singing. No, it was Christmas, uh, Wednesday night service for Christmas, right? We were here singing the last song, We Wish You a Merry Christmas. Oh, yeah, it was good, man. We were ready to sing, Wish You a Merry Christmas. I'm right next to my wife. I love her. I know she loves me. We're like, We wish you a Merry Christmas. Wish you a Merry Christmas. She looks at me and says, Don't sing. 
I actually had to get up, move to the back of the church over there, stand by Miss Eva, who didn't mind me singing next to her. Thank you, Miss Eva. We sang, or at least she didn't tell me about it. She probably left going, that pastor can't sing. <laughs> I don't know, but we had a good time anyway. So, you know, it's going to be loud, but that's all right, you know. <laughs> Off key, she said, yes. Those who stand firm to the end will be saved. What does it mean to stand firm? It means not to quit. You don't give up. You don't give in. You don't budge. Friends, you want to know what kind of marriage that makes it to the end? Those that stand firm and refuse to quit. You want to kind of employees make it to the end? Those that stand firm and refuse to quit. You want to know what kind of Christians make it to the end? Those that stand firm refuse to give up. Many of us will ring the bell because of discouragement. Friends, I'm going to tell you something right now. If you've been in church any length of time, if you start coming to this church or go to another church and you get plugged in there, eventually somebody in that church is going to hurt you. They're going to hurt you. You know, it's going to happen. It may be leadership. It may not be leadership. It may be a misunderstanding. It may be something that somebody's trying to stretch you to grow into, but you take it the wrong way. One way or the other, sometime or another, you're going to get hurt. Are you going to give up? No. Are you going to walk away from God? No. If you do, you're going to miss the blessings of God. Some of us quit because we're discouraged. Some because of fear. Some because of depression, anger, hate. Sex, drugs, pornography, lust, peer pressure will attack you and try to make you ring the bell. It will come from all different walks of life. For some, it will be pain or sickness. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to over the phone that, that, that are struggling and they're like, I've given my life to the Lord. I love him. I've been praying for healing. And yet I'm still sick and I don't understand. I wish I had the answers. I wish I could explain why. I don't. But I know I got a God who will never leave me nor forsake me. And I know if I live a hundred years on this life in absolute misery, it is nothing but a drop in the hat to the eternity of the blessings I'm going to have. Friends, eternity is a long time. I'm 40-something years old. I won't tell you how old. 40-something years old. And I can remember that it's just going by like this. And every year after 40 gets quicker and quicker and quicker. I imagine once you hit 60, it's like, boom. I don't know. I mean, it just goes quicker and quicker and quicker. Time. Eternity. Think about this. Sometimes we're so worried about the job we got or that we're going to get, or about the house that we're paying for, or the money we got in the bank. Can you take any of that with you? Can, you, can any one of you take any of that with you? And you know what? Honestly, please don't be offended by this. When you're dead and gone, you ain't going to care about it no ways. And I tell you what I told my family, my, my, my parents, whatever you got that you've been saved from me, sell it. Enjoy your retirement. I don't want your junk. I got my own junk. Ain't nothing in your house I want. I don't need your land. I don't need your money. I don't need none of it. Sell it. Enjoy your life because I got my own life that I'm living too. I don't know what you're hanging on to it for. Now, if Donald Trump happens to be a relative, Donald, you can send me something. It's okay, all right? <laughs> or Bill Gates, you know, whoever. Yeah. You know, it's stuff. Stuff means nothing. What means something the only thing that will matter, the only thing that will stand the test of time, the only thing that will stand beyond your life here is what you've done for the Lord. It's the work that you've done for God. You know what? That, that, that statement that we all want to hear, all of us who are trying to stand firm to the end or trying to make it to the very end, that statement that we all want to hear from God Almighty when we see Him is, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I've told you this a million times, and I'll say it a million more times as long as you come to this church. In order to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, you have to do well. 
And you have to be good and faithful, and you have to be a servant. You can't live life how you want to live it and expect to hear that. The only thing that will stand the test of time are the things that you do for Jesus. There's too much at stake to quit. Too much at stake to ring out. Do you realize your choices affect everybody around you? Think about that. I gave you stats. 1,500 pastors leave the ministry a month. What about those individuals that they've been ministering to? How do you think that affects them? How do they feel about that? How do you feel when you have a mentor or somebody that, that steps out, they ring the bell and they check out and you're left there going, what do I do? You know, it, it affects everyone around you. If just one of you in this room quits what God has called you to do in this church and in this ministry, it'll have a ripple effect to everybody around you. Sometimes the enemy will lie to you. He'll tell you, they won't miss you. They don't, they don't even know you. Especially, especially if for some reason you come in and the pastor's very busy because he's running the soundboard and he's trying to fix it and the drums, the drummer lost his drumstick in the middle of the song and he's trying to find it for the drummer and you know, the, the, there's some kind of background noise and he's getting the live feed going and there's all this stuff that happens and, and he's trying to prepare for the message too and he's trying to load the, the scriptures on the screen and, and tell Will not to fall asleep while he's doing it, which he's not asleep, don't worry about it, I'm just making sure he's awake, okay? You know, and, and all this stuff is happening and you come in and you say, hey brother, and for some reason his mind's off somewhere else because, you know, he's not doing anything else at all. And he doesn't hear you. How many of you walked out and go, preacher mad at me about something? He's going he to cheat me like that. I ain't going back to that church. And what we ought to say is, pastor, I spoke to you. You didn't hear me. Oh, I'm sorry. I was really busy. I was working on this or that. You need some help? Sure. Let me teach you how to do this so I don't have to do it. Amen. You know, I mean, that's what the point is right there. Instead of getting a chip on your shoulder because the enemy wants to lie to you and say, see, he don't care about you. He doesn't care about you. If he cared about you, he paid attention to you. The reality is that sometimes people are just busy. There's things that are happening. How do you know that the person that you spoke to on the way in the morning didn't just have a fight with their spouse on the way here and they're thinking about, man, I blew it again. I put my foot in my mouth. I should have never said what I just said. And you get to church and everybody puts on that nice fake smile when they walk in the door. Hey, brother. Hey, sister. How you doing? I'm great. Everything's fine. Y'all don't do that around here, do you? No. Oh, come on now. Y'all should move away. Lightning might come. <laughs> no, we need to learn how to plug in with each other and be there for each other. Because I want to tell you something. The only way you're going to make it to the very end is to be connected. Even Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. He didn't send them out one by one. Even Jesus, God incarnated in flesh, got a band of brothers around him to be an encouragement and strength to him and for him to be an encouragement and strength too. We all need each other. That's the reason why the body of Christ exists. That's the reason why we don't just, you know, go straight up to heaven the minute we get saved. We're here because we need each other. This is a hard life. It's a hard world that we face. The enemy will attack left and right. And if you're not prepared and ready, you'll ring the bell. You'll quit. You'll walk out. You'll give up. But when we plug in with one another and lean on each other and reach out to one another, then we're successful. Again, the scripture says, Matthew 24 and 13 says, He who endures stands to the end, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's what happens when you read a bunch of different translations. You get them all mixed up. Notice it doesn't say, it does not say, He who starts the race but does not finish it wins the prize. It doesn't say that. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 9 that there's many that run the race, but the one who wins are those who are willing to train. Willing to train. 
That's what we're here for. That's what small groups are about. That's what church is about. This is training ground. This is where we get prepared and ready to, to go out there and fight. Also, to again, Hebrews 12, 1 says that, that we are challenged to run the race that's set before us with patience. Patience. Any of y'all ever seen any marathon runners? You know, they, they, they don't get out there and they don't, they don't start sprinting, do they? Nah. Any of y'all here run marathons? Yeah. You don't get out there, you don't sprint. You can tell I don't, amen? Okay. You don't get out there, you don't sprint, you know, as fast as you can. You start off a real slow pace, a jog, you know, because you're going to be in this thing for the long haul. And friends, that's what I'm telling you, the same is true with our walk with God, you know. We need to take this thing slow with him and work on it and, and allow him to build, on, build in us and, and around us so that we can stay the course. In fact, uh, uh, you know, we can't quit, we can't give up. It is not a sprint, it's a marathon that we're running and we have to run with patience. In 1968, in Mexico City Olympics, one lone runner entered the stadium after completing a 26-mile long run all by himself as long after the camera stopped all long after the reporters have left he was the dead last one to come in <laughs> the reason why is he had gotten injured earlier in the race he had fell and stumbled and dislocated his knee he dislocated his knee but he still finished the race in fact, he goes on to say, he says that hurl, he hurled himself to the finish line. John Stephen Aquari of Tanasia finished dead last. But before he judged him as a loser, listen to his words when they asked him why he didn't quit earlier. He says, my country did not send me 7,000 miles to start a race. They sent me 7,000 miles to finish a race dislocated knee and all he was not giving up he hobbled through he finished that race 26 mile marathon friends i want to tell you something god did not send jesus to this earth for you to start the race but for you to finish it jesus did not die on calvary's cross for you to start the race but for you to finish it jesus did not raise Three days later out of that tomb for you to start the race, but for you to finish the race. And friends, I want to ask you as we close out this year and we get ready to begin the new year to recognize that you're here to finish the race. You're not here to start it. You're not here to, to just to begin a good effort and just try. This is not a trial and error. This is you learning how to finish the race that God has before you. Hebrews 10, 39 says, but we do not belong to those people who shirk back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. And that's what I want us to be. I want us to be a people. I want this church to be that kind of people. That we don't shirk back. Friends, there's going to be a lot of things that are coming up in our society. The longer you walk this walk, the harder it's going to be. But don't worry, he'll be with you. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. The longer you walk this walk, the harder it's going to be in this world. And I don't know what the future holds for our faith. I don't know if some point in time, while I'm still alive, I know it'll happen eventually, but maybe even while I'm still alive, that we may be camped out in people's homes and meeting in secret to worship in fear that our lives will be taken. It could happen. We're headed that direction. It's in the good book. We know it's going to happen. But he didn't call us to be those who shirk back and are destroyed. He called us to be those that have faith and that will stand through to the end, to not ring the bell, to not grow weary. As the praise team gets ready to come and we get ready to close, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to tell you what I'm looking for. I'm going to tell you what the Lord's looking for. He's looking for lifers. He's looking for people that will refuse to quit. He's looking for those of us who will straighten up our backs, hold our head up high, regardless of what's happening around us, and stay the course. No matter who may walk out, no matter what may happen, no matter what they may say about us, that we'll stand strong, never quit, refusing to give up, to continue on, to press on, and when we've done all to stand, stand therefore. 
Scripture says after we've belted on all the armor of God, and after we've done all to stand, to continue to stand, therefore. And that's what I want you to do right now. I want you to stand with me. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. Get my altar workers up here real quick. Just want to just be just still just for a moment. And I'm going to ask you to examine your life. Have you started the race and fallen back? Are you on again? Or are you off again? Do the circumstances of life dictate how you feel about Jesus? Or does how you feel about Jesus dictate the circumstances of life? With every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to ask you, are you ready to surrender? Are you ready to give him your heart? Are you ready to give him your life? Are you ready to be what he's called you to be? Will you refuse to give up? Will you stay the course? Will you stand with him? And when you've done all else to stand, to continue to stand, never looking back, never giving up, never giving in. If that's you today, I want you to lift your hand up real quick. Yes, I see him. Yes, I see hands going up all over this room. Yes, yes. You can put them back down. Friends, maybe you're here today and you don't even know why God brought you, but you're here. I want to share with you. He loves you. He loves you enough not to let you to continue to go the way you've been going. He loves you enough to put you in a place where people can love you in spite of the things you've done, places you've been. The things you've said, the attitudes you've possessed. He loves you enough to forgive you. If you want that forgiveness today, raise your hand. Let me see him. Yes, 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 yes. Everywhere. Put him down. I'm going to ask you when this altar opens, if you raise your hand and you meant it, I want you to take a step of faith and come forward and declare. So Father, we just come in the name of Jesus. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. And we give you praise for all those hands that were raised, Lord God. For all those that said, we're not going to give up. We're not going to give in. We're not looking back. We trust you. We believe you. And we receive you. We won't quit. As this new year approaches, Lord, it'll be your year. We will serve. And we will follow. In Jesus' name, the altar's open. Will you come?